Welcome. All right, so quick uh, apologies to all of the, the triviaites out there, the triviacs. Uh, for last week, I was unable to do trivia because my stomach was a war zone. <laughs> um, I, I don't know any other way I can embellish it other than that, but this is not a gastroenterological podcast. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. Welcome, one and all, to the shop that doth chop. This is a movie podcast, or a play of words, if you will, <laughs> that concedes that remakes shall happen, so why shouldn't buffs of movies like us decide <laughs> who shall be recast in those <laughs> iconic roles? <laughs> I will be your host this evening, and my name is... The Merchant of Travenis, a.k.a. The Two Gentlemen of Traverona, a.k.a. Travolio. Oh, yeah! <laughs> All right, I'm dropping the Shakespearean tone. I am joined here in the shop by my co-host and co-producer, Shakespearean Shawnet, <laughs> a.k.a. Venus and Ashaunus, a.k.a. This is the best one. Titus Chondronicus. <laughs> And in our third seat, Chop Shop Regulator, Antony and Chelsea Patra, a.k.a. Romeo and Chelliet, <laughs> a.k.a. All's Chell That Ends Chell. <laughs> <laughs> Further description of the show, the tagline says, Watch Chop Retrofit, because essentially that's what we do here. We watch older movies, sometimes they're classic films with iconic actors, and then we retrofit them by tweaking the designs with new parts. Quick disclaimer, we're not actually in favor of the remake, reboot, sequel-dependent cinematic culture. I do bite my tongue. This is more of an exercise in satire and irony. We try to be funny, and sometimes we succeed. Bringing us to the theme of the episode, we're doing Shakespearean films. And I'm surprised that we haven't done this theme before. There's so many movie adaptations mm -hmm. of Shakespeare's works. Uh, in particular, no. Uh, speaking of, the Guinness Book of World Records lists 410 feature-length film and TV wow. versions of William Shakespeare's plays, making Shakespeare the most filmed author ever in any language. As of June 2020, the Internet Movie Database lists Shakespeare as having writing credits on 1,500 films, including those under production but not yet released. The earliest known production of a Shakespearean play was King John, released in 1899. <laughs> wow. So, thoughts on the genre, Chelsea? It, it's big. It is big. Um, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're shit. <laughs> right. And as with anything, it depends on who's behind the production. Of course. It is kind of neat to see how people... Interpret it? Yeah take it and run with it a little bit. Absolutely, and there are lots of examples where people juxtapose Shakespearean ideas with contemporary, or I should say transpose Shakespearean ideas with contemporary settings. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about a few of those tonight. Sean, you are uh, in wedlock with a theater person. <laughs> How does your lovely wife, Ali, feel about Shakespeare? It's one of those staples, I think. Yeah. Uh, she's not particularly a, an avid slash rabid fan of Shakespeare. Okay. However, you know, there are several English teachers and professors who specialize in, in Shakespeare and it's their bread and butter. That's you know, those are the ones that go crazy over anything Shakespeare. But well, you know, th there's something for everybody in Shakespeare. You've mm -hmm. got war, you've got murder, you've got crime, drama, romance. It's anything. almost as you like it. And yeah, exactly. Uh -huh, funny. Uh, so yeah, there's plenty to choose from and uh, as Chelsea said, there's uh, some are good and some are shit. Right. So, you know, we, <laughs> all 410 can't be winners. As if it were not enough to shit on my doorstep, you must rub it in. <laughs> I have something cool. Yes. Um, one year for my birthday, I got all of Shakespeare's writing in these, like, leather-bound books. Oh, really? Oh, it's gorgeous. We have this collection. 
Michelle and I have it on our shelf in our living room. Like the little book? The little books, they're red, leather bound, and they're all one collection, right? Yeah. Yeah, we have that. That's awesome. I stole it from you when you were moving. (sighs) Not really. We've had these for a while. She tried to give them away to somebody. I was like, no. 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 (laughs) All right, so that's going to bring us into our next segment, which is going to be the Midnight Double Feature. And this is where we go around the panel. And we each talk about two films that are within our subject to hand. And we talk about how they are related to each other, how they're related to the subject, and why they would be a good pairing for a double feature. And so, Chelsea, would you like to go first with yours? Sure. Um, I am using 2001's Get Over It, and I'm pairing it with 2008's Hamlet 2. Yes! These are both set in a high school and they're both taking Shakespeare plays and turning them into a musical. I love it. All right, so I've never seen the first one. Say say the name again. Uh, Get Over It. Get Over It with Kirsten Dunst. Yep, Ben Foster. They do Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. Okay. Or something. A Midsummer Night's Dream. And Cisco's <coughs> in it. Is <laughs> Thong, the thong, thong, thong. <laughs> Um, I love Hamlet 2. Hamlet 2 oh, is Hamlet amazing. Is the yeah. She was great. And the main guy, uh, I, I always blank on his name. I think he's like the lost Coogan. Python. Coogan, yes. yeah. Steve, Steve Coogan. Coogan, yes. He, it's hilarious. Yeah. And some people will glance over that title and actually think there's a sequel to Hamlet. Very good. I love your, I love your double feature, Chelsea. Thank you. All right, moving it over to you, Sean. Well, speaking of Hamlet, I'm doing two Hamlet-adjacent films. Okay. First is 2018's Ophelia, starring Daisy Ridley. Yep. Uh, You've got uh, Naomi Watts as Gertrude. You have Clive Owen as Claudius. I watched this. What did you think? I thought it was an interesting concept, although it did not hold my attention Mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, I love the idea of... You know, there's more to Ophelia's story. Yes. There's something, you know, there's obviously a, a, a backstory. And so we're given that. And we're given her interaction with Hamlet and her suicide. And I don't want to give away too much of the... Uh, the... You don't want to give away the plot? Of no, 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 no. <laughs> I'll give that away. If you haven't read it or heard about it yet, sorry. But in terms of this film, you know, there things are not always as they seem. True. Um, it's okay. It's okay, but uh, you know Daisy Ridley is, you know, hot as She's a, awesome. an actress, yes. and of course, you know Ray from Star Wars. So people would be drawn to it for that reason. So I'm pairing that with uh, a film from 1990, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Yes, you have a very meta um, film uh, by Tom Stoppard uh-huh. uh, about two minor characters in Hamlet who are kind of locked in this weird uh, limbo. Yeah, limbo is a great word. Uh, they they just can't deviate from the plot. And is one of them Tim Roth? Uh, it's Tim Roth and Gary Oldman. And Richard Dreyfuss! So you've got a great cast, and it's it's very uh, it's heady stuff. Yeah. It's about, you know, the, the, the magic of theater and the trappings of theater as well. And uh, I've seen this movie twice. I saw it once when it came out. Yeah. And I was too young to understand what was going on. And then I saw it again and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. this yeah. is art. True. It has so very little to do with Hamlet itself. Right. Uh, oh, I want to backtrack to Ophelia, though. There is one really great thing about that movie, and that is the, uh, the play within a play that Hamlet puts on to kind of stick it to his uncle. The shadow play that the performers do yeah. to reenact what happened, and they create this giant skull. All the characters are, it's those it's that troop that do the really cool body contortions yes. to create these great shadows. And there's like a very Medusa kind of thing that they're doing, mm-hmm. and then they turn into a big skull. That for that me was awesome. Was was worth watching visually. Film. Yes, uh, it's a big payoff. But, uh, yeah, some, some Hamlet-adjacent films that uh, I think both are worth checking out. I would definitely recommend Rosencrantz and Guildenstern over Ophelia. Right on. Uh, one thing about the, uh, the Shakespearean films that are in period, the costumes are amazing. Uh, so if you are a costume or scenery buff in terms of historical dramas, uh, a lot of these will get your yayas. Uh, so I went with... A couple of movies that are modern interpretations, 
or adaptations of Shakespeare movies that are set in modern times. And the first one is called O, mm -hmm. and it's an adaptation of Othello. It was directed by Tim Blake Nelson, okay. who a lot of people know as Del Mar from Oh Brother Where Art Thou, or he's also in The Watchmen, and he's been in a ton of things, but he's actually directed a few movies. He also directed Leaves of Grass. Okay. I don't know if you've seen that with, um, with oh geez, uh, not remembering it, cut this out. Also, he directed Anesthesia and Eye of God, uh, Edward Norton. Edward Norton is in Leaves of Grass. He plays two parts. He's, he's twins okay. in that movie. Uh, so this movie has a 64% on Rotten Tomatoes. From Google. Moving the classic tale of Othello onto the basketball courts of a high school, the story focuses on a young black man named Odin, played by Mackay Pfeiffer, who is convinced by a conniving best friend, Hugo, played by Josh Hartnett, that his girlfriend, Julia Stiles, is cheating on him. Of course, what Odin doesn't know is that Hugo is in fact motivated by his own jealousy of Odin's good fortune. It is a sticky situation in classic Shakespearean tradition. So obviously Othello is one of the tragedies of Shakespearean's, uh, Shakespeare's works. Um, pairing this with another movie that's one of his comedies, or based on one of his comedies, it's Ten Things I Hate About You, which is an adaptation of Taming of the Shrew. This one is uh, from 1999, directed by Gil Younger. Uh, he's mostly got TV credits. He did direct a couple of other movies. One is called Ten Things I Hate About Life, which is about a suicidal couple, kind of a Romeo and Juliet situation. Sounds like a grab. Uh, he also directed uh, Think Like a Dog, but this movie, Ten, Ten Things I Hate About You, has a 45% on Rotten Tomatoes. Cat That's Stratford, it? 45, That's a little 45. Low. I think it's low. Wow. Yeah. I, I agree. 55. Oh, I'd go more than that. I would be upper 60s. Okay. Yeah. Cat Stratford, once again played by Julia Stiles, is beautiful, smart, and quite abrasive to most of her fellow teens meaning that she doesn't attract many boys. Unfortunately for her younger sister, Bianca, played by Larissa Olenik, Olenik? Olenik, uh, Olenik? Yeah. Larissa Olenik, house rules say that she can't date until Kat has a boyfriend. So strings are pulled to set the dour damsel up for a romance. Soon, Kat crosses paths with handsome new arrival, Patrick Verona, played by Heath Ledger. Will Kat let her guard down enough to fall for the effortlessly charming Patrick? <laughs> also, this is the first time that people realized that Joey Gordy Levi's is just little Heath Ledger. <laughs> because he's in that movie too, and the resemblance is <coughs> uh, striking. Now, is it, is it Larry Miller that's the father? I thought it was uh, Schitt's Creek guy. No. I thought it was Eugene Levy. No, it's not. No? Is, is that, am I getting the name right? Dana, he's great in, in that ridiculous role, uh, with that ridiculous rule about dating. The the scene in the in the bleachers is probably the, the, yes. the highlight of that film. I love you, baby. All right, you got to stop there. So I... got to get a license. <laughs> yes, I was just talking about how much I love you, baby. Oh, you too. And um, so that's my double feature. I'm... Connecting the two with both modern settings for Shakespearean plays and also Julia Stiles is in both of them. I like it. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's going to bring us to our feature segment, The Recast. And this is one that Chelsea told me via text probably a month ago yes. that if it wasn't included, she would be very pissed off or she would just make it part of her double feature. <laughs> and we're talking about Titus. Not to be confused with the early 2000s sitcom, <laughs> Titus. <laughs> this, with Christopher Titus. <laughs> with Christopher Titus. Uh, this is a film from 1999, directed by Julie Taymor. And Julie Taymor was already an established theater director at the time. And she had done a couple of short films. But this was her feature film debut. And boy, oh boy, did it set the stage for where she was going with the rest of her career. The visual stylings, uh, the music, 
everything is everything is great. Uh, so obviously, it's an adaptation of Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus. It's an epic revenge tragedy of brutal savagery based in Roman times. Titus, the general, returns to Rome victorious and decides to sacrifice the son of his enemy, the Goths, to appease the Roman dead. After the queen of the Goths pleads for her son's life to no avail, she sets out on a mission of retaliation that leaves few of the participants unscathed. There are not any good people in this movie. Mm -hmm. Everybody is at fault, more some than others. If I had to pick two people who did the most wrong in this movie slash play, it would be Tamora and also her lover. Um, what's his for Aaron? Aaron, Aaron yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They were really the seeds of deception that kind of set everything going. But can you really say that when you already had a war and a displacement of an emperor and two brothers who were uh, vying for that throne and a enemy queen who now becomes the queen of Rome. The drama is heavy. Now, Chelsea, you recommended this. What are your big takeaways from the movie? I mean, I, gosh, it's been a while since I've seen it. Right. But I remember being shown this film, never didn't know anything about it, never right. read the play, nothing. And like visually, I just couldn't take right. my eyes off of it. I think I watched it like three times gotcha. after that. It was just stunning. One of the other remarkable things about it that really hadn't been done a lot at this point, maybe in Pink Floyd's The Wall, the setting, the time frame changes mm -hmm. throughout the movie without any real like, uh, any... Meanwhile, right and later, yeah. yeah. So we're, we go from uh, 1950s England to ancient Rome to Mussolini Italy to various other time periods without a without a crack in the scenes. But it doesn't feel confusing. Not at all. Yeah, I think I think it was it was very well done. Mm -hmm. And for for me, this is uh, a, a a really fun play anyway. It's one of the most violent stories yeah. yes. in Shakespeare's oh, wow. arsenal. And not to give away the ending for anyone who's not seen it, but the big payoff is great. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's ironic that Anthony Hopkins was cast in that role given his previous roles that he's most famous for. Right. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good one and worth watching. I chopped off my hand with some fava beans and a nice <laughs> Chianti. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the roles that we're going to recast, uh, we've got Titus Andronicus, played by Anthony Hopkins, who was 62 at the time. We've got Tamora, played by the amazing Jessica Lange. Uh, she was 50 in this movie and hot as fuck. Uh, next, we've got Saturnius, sorry, Saturninus. Saturninus? Saturnius? Saturninus. Saturninus, played by Alan Cummings, who was 34 at the time. He's great. Oh, yeah. Uh, Longtime theater person. He uh, really chewed up the scenery. Reminds me a little bit of uh, the guy who plays Pee Wee Herman, Paul Rubens. <laughs> like, I, I <laughs> almost want, Yeah, I almost <laughs> wanted to pick Paul Rubens, but he's too old. Uh, so, yeah, those are the roles we're going to recast. We did not recast the role of Aaron the Moor. Or um, the child uh, Luc Lucinius, but I think these are the main players. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we should also mention that her sons, uh, Tamora's sons. One of them is Jonathan Rhys Myers. Yes, mm -hmm. and he is really geeked out in this <laughs> in this role. Like he's on edge. He and his brother are constantly just fighting each other slash looking for some mischief to get into. All right, so over to you, Chelsea. Who is your Titus Andronicus? Um, so my actor, probably known a little bit more for TV because he was in two amazing TV shows, uh, Malcolm in the Middle and Breaking Bad. I went with Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston's an interesting pick for this. I think 
he can pull that sort he, of... He's got the gravitas. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. Um, all right. Yeah, I got you. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I, went with a, you. I went with a 61-year-old actor from uh, South Yorkshire. And gotcha. he's uh, <clears throat> been in lots of things. Uh, but uh, you would know him from Black Death. You might have seen him in the most recent uh, Snowpiercer TV series. Uh -huh. You would definitely know him from Game of Thrones. You definitely know him from Lord of the Rings. He's known for dying. We did an episode yes. about it. I went with Sean Bean. Sean Bean. If the listeners are interested, go back and listen to the episode entitled, He Dies at the End. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my... Uh, Gosh, I hope you guys like this. I just stumbled across it. My actor is 61 now. He was in Action Jackson. Okay. He was in Blood In, Blood Out. And he's also in all three of the Back to the Future movies as Biff Tannen. Oh. It's Thomas F. Wilson. No. Thomas no. F. Wilson <laughs> is going to bring the Shakespearean chops for this role. And also, is he a little bit of a... <laughs> Little bit of a face value connection there with, with Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next one. We've got Tamora. Tamora is played by Jessica Lang. She was 50 at the time. I've already lauded her physical prowess, but her acting in the movie is uh, just on a next level. Yeah. I, I thought it was great. Did, oh, yeah. Do you not agree? Oh, no, oh, 100%. Geez. Do you not agree? So, Tamora, Jessica Lange, 50 at the time, who's your pick, Chelsea? So, my actor is close to that age and just a wonderful actress, in my opinion. Um, she was in Unbreakable, Beowulf, The Princess Bride, Forrest Gump, oh, Robin Wright. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Knee Pen. Yeah, no, not me. Yeah, uh, Jessica Lange is, is like a, a, a beautiful, venomous snake in this movie. Oh, yeah. Ready to almost strike. Like a, almost like an Angelina Jolie praying mantis. Kind of, yeah. Uh, I went with a 54-year-old uh, actress who is known for films such as Unbreakable, Beowulf, Forrest yeah. Gump, and The Princess Bride. I, too, went with Robin Wright. What? Yeah. yeah. She's a... And you, you guys did not know. No. Did not know. All right. She is... Exactly what this movie. Oh about. yeah, that's a good call. That's I mean, a really good her call. Her House of Cards role. That's what is I basically to Tamora. Yeah, easily translates into this. Yes. Role. Wow. Good job, guys. All right. Well, my actress, I did not pick Robin Wright Penn. It, there's no pen. The pen is mightier. There you go. The good setup. Set and spike. Uh, <laughs> she's 49 now. She was in Mystic Pizza. She was in Shag. Partially filmed right here in Florence, South Carolina. She's in Double, Je Double Jeopardy and SLC Punk. Her name is Annabeth Gish. Annabeth Gish. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be my tomorrow. Okay. I've never recast her before. No, that's right. I've never pick. shopped her before. Next up, we've got our third and final role for this outing, and it's going to be Saturninus. Also, can you guys tell me how to say? Caroline Nanus? Carolinia Nanus? Coriol Coriolanus? Coriolanus. 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 Uh, Alan Cummings was 34. Chelsea, who's your pick? Gosh, I really struggled with this one. Yeah? I had a hard time. Um, he is flamboyant. He's mm -hmm. a big personality. I mean, I had a hard time. Anyways, my actor... I don't know. I'm still a little unsure of this. He's on the TV show Atlanta. Mm -hmm. He's been in Solo, Star Wars. Yes. Yeah, I went with Donald Glover. Wow, that's interesting. I thought he could do it. I was like, well, he does kind of have that like pan, pansexual. Well, just nature. the stuff with like his music and some of these yeah. personas that he takes on. I'm like, Sh I think he can do it. That's really good. I like it. I can see it. Um. Song? Alan Cunning was probably my least favorite part of this movie because okay. Saturninus's part does not call for the flamboyant, impish kind of role. No. He is very 
conniving and very power mad and I went with somebody more masculine in okay. a traditional sense of the word. Who did you see in this? So I went with a 34 year old actor who was in Harry Potter. Uh-huh. Uh, he was in the in between. He was in the in betweeners too. He was in Pitch Perfect, but most people will know him from Bridgerton. I went with Freddie Stroma. Freddie Stroma. Stroma. Okay. All right. Uh, you get points from my lovely wife Michelle. Drink. Uh, because Michelle. just for referencing Bridgerton. It's gonna come up again. She's <laughs> all about that show. Uh, all right. So it's my pick. I picked an actor who's 34 now. Uh, everything I say is going to give it away. He was in American Horror Story, X-Men, Deadpool 2, and WandaVision as Fietro. His name <laughs> is Evan Peters. I shopped him. Yeah, he's yeah. the right age. He's yep. quirky. I can see Evan Peters. kind of weird. Yeah. 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 So that was where I went with it. Um, I think... It's pretty obvious to the room, but we should tell the listeners this is a recommend. Oh, absolutely. Huge recommend. Do not ever watch Julie Taymor's Twelfth Night, however. Oh. No, I'm sorry, not Twelfth Night. The Tempest? The Tempest. I like The Tempest. You like that movie? Yeah. Oh my god, I thought it was terrible. Well, I liked it. And I think that it has some of the same visual stylings as this. It also has the dude from Blood Diamond in it. I thought that the special effects bordered on like PBS Doctor Who episode quality. Very bad. Okay, well maybe I need to relook at it. It didn't do it for me. But this one was great. Watch, yeah, watch mm-hmm. this one. And with that, we'll say we're going to go to intermission. But let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. And get ourselves a rack of lamb. An aqua vitae? Or some coral anus? (laughs) (laughs) Coral's anus. We are back. Thank you, Chop Choppers, for bearing with us during intermission. Free Brittany. And and when we come back from intermission, what do we like to do, Sean? Beer check-ins. And we've got one that's Fairly on theme. Well, yeah, it's from England. It's an English ale. And what is it? It is Samuel Smith's Nut Brown Ale. And back in the day, maybe uh, 15, 16 years ago, this was the shit. I would go so far as to say like the mid-90s, mid to late 90s. Well, that was before my uh, craft beer cherry breaking. But... I do remember that in the early, early days of midweek seminar, this was a go-to. Oh, sure. Our, their chocolate stout is still kind of a that's winner. That's not bad. It's way better than in Newcastle. Oh, that's not hard to do. Yeah, I can... Oh, <laughs> to be better than in Newcastle. Yeah. Yeah. No, seriously, you've got a nuttiness to it. That's mm-hmm. nice. It's mild, as you would expect for an English ale. Um, it's uh, malty and... It's well done. Uh, you just described my personality. It's got nuttiness. <laughs> it's easy to swallow. You're, you're, you're malty. <laughs> I'll give you that. I'm quite malty. All right. So now that we have enjoyed that, we're going to talk about our 2021 movie marathon. And this is where throughout the year we try to watch as many movies as we can and we check them in on... Twitter and Letterboxd and oh announcement time announcement time after this season and we're only like 12 episodes away from the end of the season I will be switching my movie marathon check-ins to my own Twitter feed to back to my own Twitter feed it was originally there but we tried we we moved him over to the cinema chop shop Twitter feed to try to get more traction um, I think we've got that traction but my movie check-ins will be under my own That's Twitter cool. feed, which is Travis Grant Allen, my actual legal name. So, I, as of this recording, it is the 64th day of the year, and I'm on number 75. 82. 134. And- <laughs> so, how is it that you're managing to stay so far ahead of us, Chelsea. 
Well, I got that big jump, but I think I was thinking about this too because I was like, gosh, this felt like such a chore last year and I almost didn't make it. And I think it's because throughout the start of this, I've been regular on the show. Yes. So now it. Your poops are solid. (laughs) Yeah, it just, just feels like it's part of the job at this point. Okay. I think another thing, and correct, you know, you can contradict me if you like. When you get off to a good start at the beginning of the year, you get some momentum. That momentum, and you want to keep it going. That inertia. I mean, it, it could be, but it just, at the same time, it's, it just you're doesn't just feel like as much of a, a chore. You're, and you're also okay. on record as saying that quite a few of them are not worth mentioning. Some of, some of the movies. Yeah, well, some of them were shit. Yeah. Some of them like made me actually want to barf. But... You do have something to check in, right? What's your first check-in, Chelsea? So, um, Criterion Channel put on a movie by Solange Knowles called When Uh, I Get Home. Okay, I haven't seen this. So, it goes with her album, A Seat at the Table. And it's it's about black culture, Mm -hmm. Houston culture, rodeo culture. It's strange as hell. Okay. In a cool way. I think that... That is a good description of Solange. It really is. Strange I, as hell in a cool way. Yeah, and that's... I think I literally said that to you when I was explaining her. Um, yeah, I found it really interesting. I don't quite understand everything. Right. Because um, you're a white girl. Well, yeah, and I'm not from Houston. Yeah. But it's, it's really, Mostly it's not being from Houston. Well, no. There's, there's a lot of, like... Houston centric things. Gotcha. It's shot there's there. nuances. It's shot there. I mean, yeah. there's iconic places that I guess they show that wouldn't resonate, but it was it was really interesting. I liked it. Uh, Hurricane Katrina was the natural disaster that made me realize how close Houston is to New Orleans. Yeah. I never realized how close they are. It's right there. Houston is practically a Cajun city. Yes. It's very much so. All right, over to you, Sean. Your first check-in. All right, my first check-in is going to be a uh, horror movie called Sacrifice. Okay. And this is a Scandinavian Lovecraftian horror film. Scandinavian. Yes. Uh, my hat is off to the sound design team. They did some really cool shit to make you feel what you should feel. Mm-hmm. Some of the lighting, however, was a little cheesy, but all in all, it was a really neat small Scandinavian town with a uh, an American in in a fish out of water kind of thing yes. um, and it had a twist ending that was appropriate okay so uh, I, I give it high marks because a lot of times you get the twist ending and you're like oh come on this one yeah so it's a recommend it's a it's a good recommend and for it's a, from this year uh, it is a 2021 release yeah all right cool I'll check it out my first one is going to be the United States versus Billie Holiday. I finished this this morning. And? I was fascinated by it. I was floored by this movie. Yeah. I did not expect it to be so visceral. Me I did not, either. I did not expect there to be so much graphic uh, exposition yeah. of both her drug problem and her her sexual life yeah. um the actress who plays the title yeah, character I, her name is andra day and it's her first major movie i'm astonished by this she yes. is brilliant it was great my official review uh i saw the preview on cbs sunday morning so i knew it would be good but damn Props to the singer slash first time actress, Andra Day. Um, It's a story that some people might not be aware of that this movie shed some light on. Yeah. All right, next up for you, Chelsea. Um, I'm going with a documentary about a musician. Okay. Uh, Billie Eilish and- The world is pretty blurry right now? The world's a little blurry. Okay, so I haven't watched it yet. The thing that has prevented me from watching it is that it's over two hours long. It is very long. Okay, and but is it good? <sighs> no. It's not. Okay. Their family and her, like, they're adorable. I give them 
all the credit in the world. Like they have, the parents have two talented kids who Is have Phineas, sky, the yes, other one, Phineas. Yes, have skyrocketed to fame, and both of them are still a hundred percent grounded. They're amazing family. But the movie itself. How whoever directed this. There is no direction. There is no. There's nothing. You're just like watching videos in your gallery on your phone or something. Okay. It's very strange. Gotcha. So the um, the through thread wasn't there. There was no story no, arc to the not movie. Not at all. Yeah. I, I in my review I said it. If this is a documentary, then security and dash cam footage are too. Yeah. Well. Hundred percent. There is that documentary that's made up just of Russian. I know, I know, I know. It's, that's but amazing. It felt like somebody just turned a camera on and yeah. said that we're committed to this. But, but not in a like cinema verite positive. Way. I do want to make one one comment about this though. I I love the authenticity of the family. They they're adorable and everything. However, somebody had the forethought to record all this at the early stages of her career before she mm. busted loose and got famous. So and maybe she was just one well, of those no, very charismatic And, and here's the thing, no, -uh. it's not it's not like that because much like Justin Bieber became famous on YouTube, yeah. her and Phineas became pretty famous on SoundCloud and it happened quick. I get oh, that. Okay, okay, okay. So this that well, then, predates this. Well then somebody was very astute and said we need to turn a camera on. Document it. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, it, love or hate her music, she's fucking interesting as hell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who nope. is making that sound? Nobody. Yeah, Nobody. don't get me wrong, I think that uh, they're, they're very interesting. What the hell is a Billy eyelash? <laughs> What the fuck is the internet? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, over to you, Sean, your yeah, next pick. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to crack open a beer while we're doing this. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Heist Brewing in Charlotte, North Carolina. Nice. It's called Dank, Daniel. It is a hazy pale ale. Very cool. So I'll pop that open uh, right after I finish reading this. Uh, this is uh, Wrong Turn. This is the newish iteration of the Wrong Turn films. Is it a reboot? Uh, you tell me. And I, it feels different. Yeah. Okay. So this is from 2021, and this is about a group of uh, kids that are hiking. Well, actually, they're driving through like Appalachian country, mm -hmm. and uh, they stop at an Airbnb or something, a bed, a real bed and breakfast, I guess. And they get off. Airbnb. Yeah, they get off on the uh, Appalachian Trail and go missing. Uh, Matthew Modine is the father of one of the kids, and he's taking it upon himself to go find out what's happened to his daughter. Um, and, uh, yeah, he kind of digs around and finds out. And it's, it's pretty harrowing. Yeah. Was it well done? The it, movie itself? I actually was pleasantly surprised and enjoyed this. I had two issues, and, and Chelsea's going to cringe because I've already said this. Where do I buy the tiny day packs that can fit an entire campsite in? I mean, if that's what you're going to nitpick on a horror movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. I do want that shit, though. You just pull a string and your whole camp I mean, they're, they're, these yeah. guys were like, had these tiny little day packs and yeah. they have like really, a 12-person tent. It no, really didn't. That is, it doesn't work like that. And then, here's my, here's my biggest gripe, though. If you say Appalachia, I'll throw in Appalachia. Oh, they said Appalachia? Oh, yes. That's Everybody, right. even the people who live there. They should... Uh, probably take their ass on to the Willamette Valley. <laughs> but uh, I will say this, it was a lot of fun, it was very gritty, and the lead actress, boy, is she good. Yeah, she's I amazing. I really, really, really like this lead actress. It's right, I'll check it out. Check it out. It's Honestly, I have to say, I've never seen the original Wrong Turn. I've only, I've only seen like the first one, and it's oh, not sequels. Good. Oh, yeah, it, it's really not all that great. Right. This was amazing. Yeah, this one's In terms watching. of like horror movies, yeah. You won't, yeah. yeah, you won't be disappointed. The, uh, the credits? Uh, yes! Oh, the credits, yes. Watch yes. through the credits. Yes! So we've got some mid-credit scenes? Uh, the whole yeah. movie ends while the credits are rolling, but you've got to watch the It's credits. amazing. Okay. So it's in that um, that genre of horror that we would refer to as backwoods horror. Yes, but definitely. Mm -hmm. This would be a great one for our backwoods episode. All right. What do you think about that beer? Oh, that's tasty as hell. Yeah, it's, it's a light drinking pale ale. But it's, it's a big a, transition from the Sammy yeah. Smiths and up brown. It's got a great hot bouquet. Mmm. Yeah, that's tasty. 
I like it a lot. And once again, that's from Heist Brewing yeah. in Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. All right, I've got uh, another check-in. It's gonna be MLK FBI. This is the documentary about the FBI's surveillance of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, before his death. So my review, and this is really all I have to say about it. The fact that in 1977, a federal judge archived and sealed the FBI's surveillance records of MLK for 50 years is astounding. And I wonder if the world will still have the capacity to be shocked six years from now when those records are... I should out. hope so. I should hope so because the rumors, and I'm assuming the rumors are justified about the, the links yeah. that the FBI went to. Also, um, Martin Luther King played a really good Martin Luther King. <laughs> Chelsea, do you have another one? No, since I tagged teamed on both of yours. Sean? Oh, okay. Well, then let me uh, whip this out. Excuse me while well, I whip this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, last check-in of the week for me will be, haha, <laughs> Baby Dunn. Oh, okay, yes. I saw your review of this. Baby Dunn. This is a New Zealand rom-com. She's having a baby. Yes. Comedy. Oh my God, this is freaking fantastic. Nice. It's fresh, it's funny. Uh, the lead actress um, is Rose Matafeo. Okay. She's great. Uh, she's funny. And she is co starred by Matthew Lewis, who played Neville Longbottom in the, in the Harry Potter movies. Oh my God, I mean, we've seen pictures of him. He, he's an adult now, he's, he's very handsome. But goddamn, is he not funny? Yeah, he's great. And it's called Baby, Baby Go. Baby, Baby Done. Done. Baby Done. Okay. Um, I'm gonna watch this. For high, sure. high, high it's recommendations. Yeah. It is a lot of fun, especially for people who don't have children, and have expressed that they don't have the plans to have right, children. Right, right. No babies on purpose. Uh, this is uh, this is a good one. I really enjoyed this a lot. And Hell yeah. Executive produced by Taika Waititi. There we go. Bring it home. Oh, and also the director retweeted my review. Thank you very much. Nice. All right, my last check-in is going to be, you know, what I wrote down is Escher, Journey to Infinity. That's a documentary about M.C. Escher. But I'm really going to talk about a movie I saw last night. Uh-oh. It's Oscar. called Phoenix, Oregon. Okay. They had me at Oregon. <laughs> it's about a middle-aged bartender who decides to quit his job and team up with the chef of that restaurant that he worked at, who also is quitting, to open a bowling alley slash craft beer slash pizzeria. Okay. And it's amazing. Um, I, I know that I recognize some of the people in it, but the names are just like not there. Mm -hmm. it, it's so indie uh -huh. that you, you recognize them, but you're like, where do I recognize them from? Phoenix, Oregon. Okay. Five stars. Okay. Wow. Did they get dysentery? No. No, no, no. <laughs> On the Oregon Trail? No. Phoenix, Oregon is well south of the Oregon Trail. Okay. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> with that, should we go into the second part of our feature segment? The recast continued. Encore. The second stanza. And for this film, it's going to be... Much Ado About Nothing. Nothing. Much Ado About Nothing. <laughs> From 1993. Directed by Kenneth Branagh. It's got a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. From Google. In this Shakespearean farce, hero, Kate Beckinsale, and her groom-to-be, Claudio, Robert Sean Leonard, team up with Claudio's commanding officer, Don Pedro, Denzel Washington the week before their wedding, to hatch a matchmaking scheme. Their targets are sharp-witted duo Benedict. Can we take a moment to point out that his name is Benedict and not Benedict? It's Benedict, uh, played by Kenneth Branagh, and Beatrice, played by Emma Thompson. A tough task indeed, considering their corresponding distaste for love and each other. Meanwhile, meddling Don John, played by Keanu Reeves, plots to ruin the way. 
Um, so I think that Chelsea, you saw my review of this. I did too. On Twitter, I said, "This is why you should never play matchmaker." He finally got up the courage to say to his lovely wife. <laughs> Alright, so, um, thoughts about this before we get into the recaps? Much like Dracula, um, I think that uh, Keanu was miscast. Hmm, okay. He's out of his, he's out of his element, he's out so of his league. he and Don Pedro are brothers. Yeah, that's the problem. One of them is Denzel Washington. Yeah. yeah. One of them is Keanu Reeves. There is no explanation of why. Um, Kate Beckinsale was ridiculously young looking. Oh screen. yeah, like she didn't even look like herself. Uh -uh. Also, the opening scene with the bathing, a lot of dudes butts. A lot of dude butts. Like too much, too much butts, and also some like scrope and some fuck puck. Um, Wait, what's a fuck puck? It's like the area between the scrope and the. You know, you mean the taint? The taint. It's basically yeah. Oh, that. okay, that's another. Uh, okay. But also, there was the scene where the women were changing, and it was just like really fast. Oh yeah, flashes of nudity, but they can show all the butts they want. Yeah, what was uh, what was Brahma doing there? Yeah, he, he wanted the director. He wanted to see more butts. I guess. See more butts. Oh. All right, so the roles that we're gonna recast are Benedict, played by Kenneth Branagh. He was thirty three at the time. Beatrice, played by Emma Thompson, who was 34. I didn't realize she was a year older than him. And they were married at the time this movie came out. Don Pedro, played by Denzel Washington, who was 39. And Don John, played by Keanu Reeves, who was 29 at the time. Another thing, they're brothers, but they're 10 years apart. Well, that's, that's feasible. It's yeah. feasible, but it's not often. All right, so over to you, Chelsea. Who's your pick for Benedict? Uh, so my actor was in American Horror Story, um, Unbroken, Nurse Ratchet. I went with Finn Whitrock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. Finn yeah. Whitrock. <clears throat> All right, and over to you, Sean, your pick. I'm with an actor from Oxfordshire, England. He is Oxfordshire. 32 years old. Well, you know what? You're an American now. You say it like we do. Uh, now I'm an American? <laughs> oh, all right. He was in Crashing, Broadchurch, W1A, as well as Bridgerton in the role of Anthony Bridgerton. Mm -hmm. I went with Jonathan Bailey. Oh, that's interesting. Because I went with an actor who's 32 now. He's British. He's in The Mercy. He's in Broadchurch and Bridgerton. His name is Jonathan Bailey. Excellent choice, sir. Jonathan Bailey you is it. the right pick for this. Two out of three Chop Choppers say so. <laughs> Next. Well, the, the correct one said no. <laughs> Next, we've got Beatrice, played by Emma Thompson. So when I started watching this movie, I didn't think I was watching the right movie. I was like, this looks like a movie from the late 70s, early 80s. It's and weird, I'm, yeah. And I'm not sure what's going on. I don't recognize any of these people until they cut to the tree where Emma Thompson is reading to all of the people in the opening scene. Um, but her name was Beatrice. She was played by Emma Thompson. She was 34 at the time. Chelsea, who's your pick? My actress, um, I think it, you have to have somebody who is quick wit, a little bit funny, but yeah. also can be very stern. Yeah. Um, so my actress was in... The Double Wears Prada, um, mm -hmm. A Quiet Place, Mary Poppins. I went with Emily Blunt. Yeah, That's a good pick. We were just yeah. talking about her earlier. That's fantastic. She's delightful. And she is kind of a, like a modern iteration of Emma Thompson's persona. Yeah, uh, yeah. I like it. Go, Sean. I went with a 34-year-old actress. She can be seen in films such as Mank, mm -hmm. The Imitation Game. Oh, you're, you're going to try to get me to mispronounce her name. The Current War, oh, God. War and Peace, and uh, Sense8. I went with Tuppence Middleton. Oh, Tuppence Middleton. I can definitely pronounce her name. I thought you were talking about the 
other. Oh person. no no no! I'm I'm going uh, I'm going with some British heritage in this one. There you go. Yeah. All right, my actress is uh, 33 now. She's in Reach Me, Wolves at the Door, and also Marvel's Agents of Shield. Her name is Elizabeth Henstridge. Elizabeth. Oh right, she was the she was the nerd scientist chick in the early seasons. I stopped watching after two seasons. Oh, well, it should have been called Agents of Sword. That would have been a more, much more watchable show. Uh, next, we've got Denzel Washington's character, Don Pedro. Who uh, Denzel Washington was 39 at the time. And Chelsea, what were you thinking about for this one? This was another hard one for me. Okay. And I struggled with this. And then landed on Taika Waititi. Okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, right? I can kind of see that. <laughs> that's really interesting. Wow, you just changed the game for I this did. whole movie. Yeah. Over to you, Sean. I'm with a 39-year-old actor from Oldham, Lancashire. Lancashire. Um, I, like the type, I love the Taika Waititi yes. I, 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 I stuck with the, uh, the sexy Denzel kind of, you know, yeah. if Denzel. So this actor is uh, can be seen in Austin Land, uh, Hollyoaks, NCIS, but most people know him from American Gods or Ricky Whittle. Okay. You uh, really whittled down the competition for that role. Good job. And my pick is 39 now as well. He's on the Snowpiercer TV series. Uh-huh. He is in movies called Blind Spotting, Wonder, and a theatrical production called Hamilton. His name is David Diggs. <laughs> He's becoming like the the the, uh, the favorite of the show these days. He's a chop shop favorite. Like Dobby he's Diggs. so adorable. Like he's the new Walton Goggins on this show. No. Yeah. He's uh, he's on a, a higher tier. Than oh yeah. Walton okay. Goggins, in my opinion. Somebody somebody who's got lots of time on their hands should like do a calculation of who's been recast the most. Oh, on this? Yeah, on, on the show? show. Yeah, I mean the the chop choppers are getting really slack on their databases. <laughs> Um, we got one more. It's Don John, played by Keanu Reeves, who was 29 at the time. Chelsea? So, you need somebody who's a little bit more menacing, or believable, yeah. as menacing. Yes. So, my actor was in The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Mm. Let's talk about Kevin. Oh, with Ezra Miller. Oh, 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 yes. We have to talk about Kevin. Um... Also, he's the Flash, right? Is he gonna be the Flash? Yeah, in the, in, in the Justice League movies. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh yeah, let's not talk about that. Let's not. Over to you, Sean. I went with a thirty-year-old actor from London, England, and I'm keeping this whole idea of uh, this biracial brotherhood thing going. Um, he's got a good pedigree though when it comes to films uh, that kind of play into this Shakespearean kind of feel. Uh, he was in The Favorite. He was in Mary's Queen of Scots. He was in uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime. Haven't seen that one. I did see Mary Queen of Scots mm -hmm. at the Nickelodeon mm -hmm. before in the before times. Uh -huh. And he was in Boy Erased. That should be the giveaway. Yep. His name is Joe Alwyn. Yep. Joe Alwyn. All right. So he's American? No, he's English. Okay, okay. well, I went with an American because Keanu oh, Reeves is American. My actor is 28 now. He was in, I think he might have got typecast in like an ocean thing because he's in Lost Island, Between Waves, The Beach House, and Outer Banks. His name is Chase Stokes. Okay. Okay. Chase Stokes. Now, did you see Outer Banks? Yeah, I love that okay. show, dude. I couldn't did you get watch into it? it. Oh, I liked it. I thought it was like a... Uh, kind of like a Goonies little yeah, appeal I, to it. I got like through two episodes. I just couldn't get into Everybody it. Everybody was just too hot. No, they were just boring. Mm. boring. Too hot, boring, same thing. Yeah. Too hot, boring. And 
Final final thoughts on Much Ado About Nothing. I mean, like, it's not bad, but it's not good. There is a more recent uh, version of this movie. There's a more recent adaptation, which I'm interested to see. Uh, There's also a more recent version of Othello. J.J. Abrams did a version of this with yeah. his friends. He self-funded it, I think. Okay. Something like that. Dana. Yeah. All right, so uh, with that, we are going to go ahead and go to our bonus segment. Yes. It's going to be a battle royale between some Shakespearean villains. Who would win between Claudius from Hamlet, Lady Macbeth from Macbeth, or Iago from Othello. Mm. Oh. Excellent. Ooh. I'm just gonna go ahead and say Lady Macbeth because the picture that I got was, she's really hot. It's pretty good. Well, I was gonna say Mac Lady Macbeth as well because not only would she win this battle, but just invoking her name in the theater is bad luck. So. No. You're thinking of just the word Macbeth, right? Well, yeah, you can't say her name without saying Macbeth. Right. You can say lady, though. Yeah, right. It's the same thing. No, I just... Why is that? I don't know. You, you never asked your wife? She, I don't know if she knows or not. I'm sure there was some ridiculous catastrophe that happened during Macbeth, and, uh, you know, you know how superstition works. I do, actually. I can't stop staring at her picture now, so I'm just gonna pick her. We all picked Lady Macbeth? Nice. Unanimous Battle Royale! All right, so. Excuse me while I turn the page. Turn the page. Um, so we wanna wrap it up. I wanna thank you, Chelsea, for being here. Despite your. Um, unpleasant mood when we began. I feel like you've rounded a corner. I have. And I think that I might have been a part of that. I of hope. Course. I hope that I was. Is there anything that you want to plug? Trivia. Trivia. We'll be back this next week. Uh, my my tummy's fine. Yay. Everything will be good. Um, thinking about doing a very pop oriented playlist. I'm totally on board with that. Also yes. Free Britney. And Free Britney. And the next week, we'll plug this again next week, but the sat, sorry, the Wednesday of St. Patrick's Day, we're doing trivia, and hopefully it'll be in the, in the beer garden, and we're going to do all Irish music, all Irish-themed questions. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be a whole big weekend for Seminar Brewing. Hey, uh, wait, you forgot another thing that happens on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, also, Sean... The brew boss, I want to thank you for doing what you do. Also, your birthday is on St. Patrick's Day. Are you going to dress up like a leprechaun again? Sure, every time. <laughs> Steal my pot of gold. <laughs> and um, is there anything you want to plug, sir? Um, <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> Free Britney. <laughs> any, any beers coming out? I can't think of anything really off the top of my head of what's coming up. Uh, Get your vaccine. Yeah, go for some vaccines. I mean, I, I did mine we did today. It. Uh, Travis got his today. I Chelsea, did mine tomorrow. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're fine. So far. Nothing wrong with me. So far, so good. Uh, just do it. Don't be an ass. Do you know what next week's episode is? Uh, yeah, this one's going to be uh, one that I recommended. Con artist slash grifter movies. Grifter. Uh, so, here's your sneak preview question and answer. In the 1993 film Six Degrees of Separation, a skillful con artist, Paul, played by Will Smith, mysteriously appears at the Fifth Avenue home of an affluent family. He is injured and bleeding and claims to be a close friend of their Ivy League kids, as well as the son, as well as the son of what renowned actor? God, I have not seen this film since it came out. I way back. Think of a very film. renowned black actor. Oh, Sydney Poitier. Sydney Poitier is the correct answer. <coughs> we want to plug the podcast itself. Please rate, review, and subscribe to us on all of your podcatcher apps. We're also hosted online on podbean.com. We're a cinema chop shop on there. 
We're Cinema Chop Shop on Twitter. We're Cinema Chop Shop on Facebook. Our email, which we check damn near every day, is cinemachopshop at gmail.com. The beers we checked in today will be checked in on Untapped. That's U-N-T-A-P-P-D. Uh, we're Cinema Chop Shop on there. And we're doing a, a few things on YouTube, right? Yes. A few things on YouTube. We're trying to uh, work that out and get you guys some extra content. Hopefully, uh, we will have a have some sort of patron thing going on with the with the YouTube. But we are Cinema Chop Shop Podcast on YouTube. Finally, thank you to you, the listeners. Remember, still wear your mask and social distance, and please. Remember to watch shop retrofit. Take a bow, Josie. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Wait, why is she taking a bow? It's, it's the way you said it. It sounded like Herbert again. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Take a bow, Josie. <laughs> Herbert the pervert? Come on, Chelsea. Ah! Why don't you, why don't you come over here and take a bow? Can you bend over? Oh. Let, me, let me do it. I hate all of us. Let, 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 let me do it. Just let, let, let me do it. Just, just bend over and show us. I, I accidentally dropped my keys. Won't somebody get my keys? Sir? It's gonna be on YouTube. We'll put this on YouTube, and anybody who fucking tunes in to watch that shit will enjoy it. Oh, you have to 